Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Today I'm making part two of the Q&A I announced to celebrate my first booktube anniversary. Let's get directly to the questions. Amanda from Quotidian Books asked three things. First, which Shakespeare plays would you recommend to a newbie? I think I would probably suggest Much Ado About Nothing. It's a relatively clear storyline. The Benedict and Beatrice plot feels really modern, and many of the themes feel pretty representative of what Shakespeare liked to do in general. For those who were turned off by romance, especially those reading the text rather than watching a staged version, I might suggest Julius Caesar. It's not a play I especially like to see performed in general, but I like it quite a lot more when I'm reading it. I guess I'm really suggesting it because it was the first Shakespeare play I read after Romeo and Juliet back when I was in early high school, and I really liked it back then. I'll have to ask my son, who is much more knowledgeable about Shakespeare than I am, what he would recommend. Next, which animal would you choose to be your familiar? My familiar is a raven. I've been thinking about ravens all week. For his favorite penguin, Jason, over at Byways and Bookland, talked about Edgar Allan Poe. And I wrote in his comments about my old knitting blog, The Purloined Letter. For those of you who don't knit, purl is one of the main stitches used in knitting. Anyway, because of the blog name, and because I've always loved Poe's writing, friends and family helped me acquire various Poe paraphernalia, including my raven, who usually hangs out in the study. And Amanda's third question is, what is your favorite dessert? I used to love my father's Bananas Foster. It was one of the only dishes he really cooked, and he was a master. He'd saute long slices of banana in butter and brown sugar, pour in a little bourbon, dim the lights, and set the contents of the pan on fire, then serve it while still in flames over vanilla ice cream. This week is the fourth anniversary of his death, so it feels just right to be thinking about his Bananas Foster. A dessert with an even longer family history, a dish my grandmother used to make and told me she learned from her mother, an immigrant from England after whom I was named, a simple pound cake. It's easy to make, and honestly, I think I've made it for almost every major celebration requiring cake. Although it's great with a little vanilla extract added, or almond extract, my very favorite addition is the zest and juice of one lemon. On to the next question. Von Tristeller asks what my favorite meal is, what my favorite dessert is, and what I like as a snack. Although I've certainly eaten much more elaborate meals in my life, my very favorite meal is also a dinner I have relatively regularly. Tomatoes and okra stewed together with black pepper and served over rice. The rice has to be a fairly firm long grain rice for this dish. There are times when I cook it at home, sometimes substituting green beans for the okra, as we did last night, and sometimes I eat it out, or these days order it for delivery from our local, a pub owned by a Jordanian family who's taught me that okra and tomato over rice is also very much a dish of the Levant, often with a slightly different seasoning profile that I now love just as much as the seasonings I grew up eating. I love our global siblinghood here. As for desserts, I'm not a huge sweets eater. When I have the chance, I eat foods high in fat and salt rather than sugar. I mentioned in the last set of questions that I have a pound cake recipe with a long family history, a cake that is easy to make and delicious that is my go-to dessert. But if this is just a regular meal at my house, you will probably not get dessert at all. And if you do, it's going to be berries or some other fruit. In fact, if it's late April or early May, you might not even get a meal, just a huge bowl of fresh strawberries. And finally, snacks. I'm a big fan of popcorn made on the stove in a heavy pot and heavily sprinkled with nutritional yeast, giving it sort of a funky, nutty, cheesy flavor that my whole family loves. My other big favorite snack or lunch is anything served with hummus. 
It's great with pita or rice cakes or in sandwiches and also spread on cucumber rounds or with celery or sugar snap peas or carrots dipped into it. Not a snack, but I also really love hummus as a base to top with hot sautéed vegetables or proteins. In fact, mushrooms, Brussels sprouts, etc. over hummus sounds really good right now. A few years ago, a friend almost talked me into trying a month of the Whole30 Diet Challenge with her. And the main reason I chickened out is because it would force me to give up chickpeas for four whole weeks. Just not happening. Brian at Bookish and I recently had a long conversation about some of our cultural experiences of beloved foods, and he joked in the comments to my call for Q&A questions that he'd found out so much about me in the exchange that he wasn't sure what to ask. Then he asked this, I believe you once went out for drinks in a group with Seamus Heaney. I would like to hear more about that story, or at least to hear it again. So here goes. When I was in college... I had the opportunity to take a poetry writing class with this amazing writer and amazing teacher, Seamus Heaney. He regularly had the class over to his house, an easy walk from campus, and he was quite social with all of us. One day when another student from our class, now a published author himself, and I were sitting in the poetry room of our university's undergrad library, Heaney walked in with a rumpled older man. My friend stared at them and stopped talking. The two men walked up to us, and despite my introverted personality, my southern girl skills came out and I chatted amiably. Heaney introduced his friend to the two of us students, and then he invited us to go to dinner with them in the student dining hall. Sure, why not? What's your name again? I asked. Ted Hughes. I racked my brain. Why was that name familiar? Oh, wait, wasn't he the person who married Sylvia Plath? Wiley, someone I knew well, one of my father's best historian friends, introduced Plath and Hughes when he was a visiting student in the UK, and I'd heard about their romance and the end of it. What I had not heard of was Ted Hughes, the poet. I sat there all during our meal in the student dining hall, chatting with Seamus Heaney and Ted Hughes and my brilliant but absolutely starstruck student poet friend. And I was asking Hughes all about what he was doing as he traveled in the U.S. and with Hughes and Heaney both talking about translating ancient works. And there I was having no idea what a giant I was chatting away with. I so wish I could replay that dinner. Maybe when I schedule my next meal with famous dead people, I'll invite Ted Hughes and apologize. Incidentally, I gather the famous dead authors party question fairly commonly pops up on booktube Q&As, but I did not get that question this time. Next question. Roz from Scally Dandling About the Book says, I was originally going to ask for one of your outrageous author encounters like the Heaney story, but I was beaten to that. So I went away to think. I've concluded that I would like to hear about your future reading. Not your immediate TBR, but more how you see reading shaping up over the next part of your life. I think as readers, we experience both continuities and shifts in our reading habits and interests. Could you reflect on that with a bit of looking back and looking forward? But if you have more delightful author stories, I'm up for that too. I'm not exactly sure what direction my reading will take. I would like to be better read than I am. There are so many classic works that I've not yet read, many of which are already on my shelves for one reason or another. There are also a few different categories of books I keep finding myself making lists about without a clear plan for when I will read these books. Yes, I will always read Victorian lit and 20th century Southern lit and classic lit by African Americans, And I'll always be reading a fair bit of academic history. Recently, I found myself reading a lot of memoirs, starting, I think, when I was undergoing chemo and wanted to read about people who had survived what I was going through, and reading memoirs about other issues that might be ahead for me in my life is still an important thing. But the three subjects that are getting more emphasis right now in my head are first, 
literary biographies, which I've always loved, but which I am newly obsessed with, kind of. Classics from the early 20th century, post-World War I to post-World War II, especially in Britain. And third, calm writing about fairly remote places. I mentioned that I checked out a handful of quiet beach reads recently from the library, and I know I'm not going to get to them right away, but the idea of some beautifully written, very quiet books about appreciating the world around us is really appealing right now. Comfort reading, I guess. To address the other part of your question, Roz, which you term in one place delightful author stories, and in another outrageous author encounters, I'll give an author story I don't believe I've told yet on this channel, although I've mentioned it in someone's comments, I think. I've mentioned that my father was an historian who wrote an academic book about slave culture on rice plantations, a book that was fairly widely read not only in universities, but in South Carolina, where he was from. He was invited once to a South Carolina Writers' Conference, and I went with him as his guest for the weekend. I think I had just graduated from high school, although it might have been a year before that. The author Percival Everett was there, under 30 years old still. The conference guests were primarily elderly Southern white ladies, people who did not read new fiction, perhaps especially by young black male authors, And they more or less completely ignored Everett, despite the fact that he was a South Carolina writer and had already won awards for his fiction. Somehow, the two of us had lunch together, both days that weekend. He gave me a copy of Cutting Lisa the first day, and I read it that night. He was working on The Weather and Women then, and when it was published, he sent me a copy. Whenever I hear his name, I think I should read some of his newer works. It's been a long time now. Do you have any recommendations? I think I can get a digital copy of So Much Blue through my library. So that book might be up first. Actually, I have a bunch of other, quote, outrageous author encounters, which I'll share at some point, including one with Derek Walcott, who I think Roz might have mentioned in a recent video. Wildly, I even have another great author story kind of related to my father's book about rice plantations, but I'll save them for another day. Jen at Remembered Reads asked the next question. She says her default question for Q&As is to ask about the strangest experience folks have had since joining BookTube. During Labor Day weekend, when I put up the Quiet Beach Reads video, I saw a reference to the author Gail Godwin on someone else's channel. Actually, there's a personal author story here, which I guess I have to tell. And in fact, yet another one related to my father's book. Not the one I just alluded to either. But hold that story for a second. Back to BookTube. I have not read any Gail Godwin in quite a while, since the mid-1990s maybe. So I Amazoned her. Isn't that a great verb? Sort of a bookish way of Googling. Quick and easy and equally corporate. Anyway, I found a perfect novel to add to my list of quiet beach reads. Godwin's newish book is Grief Cottage, published in 2017, I think, and it's about life in a desolate cottage on a small island off the coast of South Carolina. I saved the book to a private, quote, Amazon wish list, a list that's actually just a list of books I plan to check out of my local library. I could use Goodreads for both purposes, right? Anyway, I then clicked back to YouTube, where there was a question from Brian at Bookish. Quote, Do you know of any books about or by any relatively modern people who spent time isolated on the South Carolina coast? Has there been such a place in recent memory? Well, that was two distinct, perfect timings. Not that I have actually responded to Brian's question on that post yet, I don't think. And wildly, when I mentioned this amazing confluence to my husband, David, he told me that when he saw Brian's comment, he Googled to see if there were any books about living an isolated life on the coast of South Carolina. And the book he had come across first was Gail Godwin's Grief Cottage. Okay, on from that confluence of ideas to the story about Gail Godwin. 
Back when I was in high school and my father's book about slave culture along the coast of South Carolina came out, a really beautiful little independent bookstore with an amazing selection of local history and local fiction opened in the northern part of the relatively lightly inhabited strip between Myrtle Beach and Charleston, South Carolina. A strip of land with a lot of quiet vacation retreats right along the ocean and a lot of working class people, black and white, living a bit inland. One day we came home after dinner out to find a message from my father on our home answering machine. You don't know me, but my name is Gail Godwin, G-O-D-W-I-N, and the folks at the bookstore just shared your beautiful book with me. I'd love to meet you and talk about it. Well, my father knew exactly who this award-winning, best-selling novelist was and almost keeled over in the living room in proud giggles. My mother, an extrovert and a consummate host, invited Godwin and her partner over to our house for dinner one night later in the week while they would still be vacationing in South Carolina. Godwin agreed, and she and her partner sat at our kitchen table, along with my parents and me and my much younger brother. I think he was eight years old, maybe. As it turned out, Godwin's partner liked music, as did my brother, and the two of them struck up a conversation. While my father sat talking about history and literature with the amazing Gail Godwin sitting in our house, my brother took Godwin's partner, Robert, to the living room and started playing the piano for him. My brother played by ear and didn't really read music at that point, but his ear was pretty phenomenal and he listened to a lot of classical music. He would play a little clip he had created in some style or other and ask if Robert could guess who composed it. Bach! he would guess. And my brother would say, no, me. And then he would play a new clip. Beethoven, Robert would guess, or Copeland. And each time my brother would proudly explain that he in fact had composed the piece himself. My mother eventually politely asked Gail Godwin's partner what he did for a living. He said he was a composer and a musician. Would he play the piano for us? And when he said yes, my brother made room on the bench and he began to play. Our jaws all dropped. My mother, in these pre-internet days, asked what kinds of music he wrote. And he said kindly, but curtly, that we could probably look him up in the local music store if we really wanted to know. The next day, we went straight to that store and they pulled out a huge phone book type catalog of music and print. This was perhaps my first... Ted Hughes moment, actually. Robert Starr had studied under Aaron Copeland, and he himself taught composition and theory at Juilliard. He had composed music for one of Martha Graham's ballets and written multiple operas and a violin concerto for Itzhak Perlman and had his work played by the Boston Symphony Orchestra conducted by Seiji Ozawa. It was such a humbling moment when we got this opportunity to meet this amazing writer and then discovered that her partner was an amazing composer. And not only did we not even realize it until after he had gone, but he had listened to my kid brother fiddling around on the piano for an hour. Looking back, I'm aware for the first time that I don't think this kind of thing could happen anymore. These days, we would have carefully reviewed the Wikipedia page on Gail Godwin before she came and seen who her partner was and read his Wikipedia page. If I had known, I'm sure I would have been too terrified to say anything to either of them had I known fully how extensively they had been recognized for doing what they did. I'm sure my mother would not have allowed my brother to play around on the piano for an hour in front of the master. But you know, I think he enjoyed his evening getting to see us entranced with his wonderfully warm and brilliant wife, but not overwhelmed with two huge stars in our midst. We certainly enjoyed that evening, too, and the story it gave us to tell. Well, that was a very long story. Jennifer Rimbard Reads also asked what she calls a silly specific question for me. She says, are you ever tempted to tag your videos ASMR? You have such a soft, mellow speaking style that you'd be right at home in that niche. 
While people have definitely told me that my style can be soporific, no one has suggested before now that I should do ASMR. I wonder if I could do a bookish ASMR video. Has someone already come up with that idea? Probably. Maybe I'll just read a really gentle bedtime story on the channel. We'll see. Sounds intriguing. Any suggestions? In fact, maybe I should read one of Gail Godwin's books. Next question. Janet Hughes says, you mentioned you are from South Carolina. How did you escape the Southern dialect? Your voice and elocution are just beautiful. I'm from Tennessee and I try so hard not to have such a Southern accent. Let me say first that I very much appreciate your comment about my voice, but really one of the things I love most about BookTube is having all these new friends from all over the globe with such different accents and styles of speaking. No need at all to try to disguise your accent. Where did my accent go? I grew up in the Carolinas, but went to college in the North for the first three and a half years. The first thing anyone said when they heard me open my mouth was, where are you from? And although I did not try to change my accent, and in fact seemed to have no ability to control how I speak even now, people did stop asking by the end of my senior year. I then spent a couple of years in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, home of what I've always thought of as the platonic ideal of a university campus. I thought for sure my southern accent would come back in full force, but it really didn't. And since then, I've married a Yankee, a New Yorker who actually went to college in the South and who naturally and genuinely says y'all now. And we lived in Philadelphia for several years, then moved to Washington, D.C. about 25 years ago. There are plenty of Southerners in Philadelphia and Washington, often here because of the Great Migration, when Southern Blacks tried to escape Jim Crow violence and find economic opportunities in urban areas of the North. But my accent is still similar to what it was when I was 22 years old. Interestingly, whenever I watch my own videos, I'm reminded of how Southern I still sound sometimes. If I talk to my mother and brother on the phone, my accent comes back more fully. And if I have a glass of wine, even more comes back. And when I read aloud and try to do even the slightest bit of different voices for characters, they all immediately sound Southern, no matter where they're from. If a character is from the Carolinas, I'm all set. But Scottish, Russian, Nigerian, Korean, Pakistani, Australian, Brazilian, when I read, everybody sounds Southern despite my best efforts. Anyway, don't try to change your voice to please other people. In fact, your natural voice will help us get to know you, the real you. It is straight up cultural imperialism for people to think that the way other people naturally talk is somehow inferior or substandard. The world is a diverse place and we need to honor that. Well, I think that will do it for today. I'll be back, I think, on Friday with part three of the answers to the Q&A, the last part, I hope. I hope you'll join me then, here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.